Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I'm not sure why my profile picture isn't working, but you can see me here. Uh, I'm developer ecosystem lead at Layer Zero Labs. And I figured if I was going to lead a talk about what bridging is, I would start with uh, the London Bridge. I don't know why that is also not showing up in format, but interesting. Uh, I think the slides are a little bit off, but it's okay. We'll kind of go from high level here. Uh, talking about bridges as a whole, right? I think the main thing we think of, especially when talking about real world bridges, is that they are a way to connect people. And what that means at a high level is that not only you're connecting actual individuals, but communities, uh, you also allow the flow of information. And information is something that's super valuable when you're connecting these groups, because with information, you can then have the transfer of real world assets, goods and services, and also the financialization of different groups across different areas. And so when we think about crypto, we have the same problem and same solutions occurring. There are groups of individuals that are isolated across these different islands that want to communicate and connect with one another. This is the Electric Capital Developer Report. And this report shows that in the last year, more than 30% of developers have moved towards building on more than one chain. And this makes a lot of sense. When we think about blockchains, we know that there are significant trade-offs depending on what chain that we end up using, both on speed, cost for actually finalizing transactions, and then security. And so when we think about all these islands that sit separate one another, that need some standard to communicate, we often want to have some type of global ledger, a way to connect all of these pathways and make it simple for applications and then users to seamlessly move both information and assets between each of these chains. But if we're going to have a system like this, we need to make it permissionless. We have to have it capable of anyone building on top of without them being potentially censored. When I say censored, I mean not only the risk of people uh, building on top of and not being able to access the protocol, but also not being able to guarantee that their message will be delivered. Someone in the middle being able to cut them off halfway through. And finally, we need this protocol to be immutable. It has to exist on chain in some unchangeable way where the core principle and interface of how the messages are one sent from a source chain and then delivered to a destination are consistent. Looking at a singular chain, and, and probably the most common example we're all familiar with, token transfers, right? Uh, ERC-20 token on one blockchain. It's very simple to see how this works at a high level because all you're doing is a communicating with the core ledger, let's say, for this case, the blockchain linea, and you are transferring assets from your wallet, deducting and debiting that amount, and then transferring that balance to an address on the same chain. So simple ledger, wiping balance from one user, adding to another. But this immediately becomes more complicated as you move to a cross-chain environment. One, these two blockchains don't have a consistent standard for communicating with one another. They don't know about each other, and they're a walled garden. So if we were going to try and build an actually sufficient cross-chain solution, we would have to have some way to transfer those assets and know that they've been deducted for sure on the source chain, and then be able to credit them efficiently on the destination. And what this ended up looking like over the history of bridging was that there would be some monolithic provider. You could think of this as a centralized entity that sat in the middle saying, hey, we'll listen to messages on the source blockchain and deliver them to the destination. You can think of this as a collection of signers, a group of uh, either providers that are sitting on some either off-chain or on-chain stack that are checking the verification of each message and making sure it's accurate. Or you can think of this as a middle chain, a blockchain that sits in between each network and guarantees its delivery. But the problem here is that what ultimately happens when that monolithic security fails? We don't like to think about it a lot of times, but really, when you're saying that you're opting in to some provider who's verifying messages for you, you're essentially going with a ton of other app developers and users and saying, I believe in their trust assumptions, and so those trust assumptions won't fail for me. But when we scale that out and look at every application built on top of that messaging layer, that cross-chain implementation, every application becomes at risk when that validation fails. And when an exploit occurs, every application on top of that network is also at risk and could potentially lose not only assets, but identity, funds, any type of data that's moving between that network. And so clearly, this one-size-fits-all mo one model does not make sense for cross-chain messages and cross-chain delivery. And when we look at the real world, if we take into account every exploit that's happened in the blockchain industry, four of the five largest exploits are due to this monolithic bridge security, with number four here only being FTX when they were having issues with their asset uh, management during bankruptcy. So it's a very huge issue when it comes to actual cross-chain messaging. 
and going back to our assumptions about this being a cross-chain reality, right? We know that we make trade-offs based on speed, cost, security, and that apps have different levels of security that they need for their application to run. Why should our cross-chain messaging be any different? Ideally, we should be able to build some type of omni-chain application that uses this global ledger of different chains that are interconnected, but also be able to configure the pathways in a way that is still immutable, permissionless, and censorship resistant, but still gives my app the ability to know what level of security I'm opting into, and also have clear decision-making power over it. Layer zero provides this in one main way. Whenever I want to send a message, you can think of this as token transfers, as just raw data itself, or anything that you could do on a smart contract and within a blockchain ledger. Any application can build on top of layer zero, call our endpoint smart contract on whatever the source blockchain is, and use an on-chain message library that stores a configuration by that application, configured by them, that says, I want these verification methods applied to my sent message, and I also want my message to be executed by this party. And so what this does is it divides the cross-chain execution and, and really the whole environment into two layers, verification and execution logic. In this example, let's say I have four security providers that I want that are going to sign off on my message. I want three out of the four of them to deliver that message to the destination chain and verify in my destination message library that, hey, these are the providers that I want with their own security techniques to verify and validate that this message is legitimate. From there, after a message is verified, anyone can come and permissionlessly execute this message. You can either configure an automatic message executor to deliver this message with full gas abstraction or come and manually execute that message so that it's permissionless still and you're not at risk if that provider isn't available one day. And so zooming this out and looking back at kind of our abstraction for cross-chain messaging and cross-chain token transfers, you now have a system where you still have uniform semantics about how to debit tokens on the source chain. You're using a common interface in the form of our layer zero endpoint contract to communicate with the protocol, and then using a configured security stack that is ensuring that your message is actually valid and doesn't fall prey to any one validation technique and doesn't assume that you want to opt into it immediately. And what this means is that zooming out, when you are on multiple different chains with multiple different contracts, in the worst case scenario, if one of your validators fails, you still have multiple different verification techniques that are securing your application, still able to transfer messages, and still able to guarantee finality at the destination. The worst case scenario in this example is that your messaging is stopped temporarily and you're able to add a new provider in at any given moment. When we talk about what a decentralized verifier network is, what are those verification techniques that I mean, these are some of them. Today, Layer Zero offers 25 plus different decentralized verifier networks, but each of them use their own validation methods and techniques and may be preferable to you, the application developer, depending on what you need. Whether it's a ZK Lite client provided by Polyhedra that aggregates 300,000 Ethereum signatures, a cryptographically secure state proof provided by Lagrange protocol, if you want to throw Google Cloud in as an established Web2 entity and know that you have both a Web2 entity and an incredibly permissionless network validating messages so that there is no collusion whatsoever, anything that you want as a validation provider can be added. And what this gives you as an app developer is future-proofing your application, knowing that as new verification techniques become popular, like we saw in the history of bridging, right, where we went from centralized providers to aggregations of signers to middle chain security, as new techniques come out that become more secure, more adaptable, more sufficient for what we need, we can easily add those verification techniques into an existing deployed application and do it in a way that doesn't infringe upon any of the core principles I mentioned earlier. Zooming out from the security standpoint alone, Layer Zero also provides app developers with tons of configurability. Not only can you configure the number of block confirmations you wait on the source chain to protect yourself from if there's a block reorg or information that wasn't meant to be passed and that source finality, you're able to guarantee that it's actually included. You're able to configure that security stack. So I could say here, for example, I want any two of these security providers to sign off on the message and have three configured in the overall stack, meaning any two out of three providers can sign off that this message is legitimate, and each of them have their own validation technique that is actually verifying that message. 
The best part, I think, and the one that I'm really interested to see people hack on over the week at ETH Global uh, is this idea of an automatic message executor. So with layer zero, by default, we provide an executor as a production asset that allows users who are on top of these omni-chain applications to only pay gas on the source chain and have that gas automatically swapped for five basis points on the destination and executed automatically for them. Meaning that a user never has to touch the destination chain themselves to know that an action has been automated and done for them. That said, we still have that concept of permissionlessness that we need to have for this protocol to actually work. And so anyone can manually come and execute that message as well if let's say this asset goes down someday. On top of that, developers have tons of configurability on what this executor can do. For example, when I'm executing my receive logic, let's say I burned a token on the source chain and I minted it on the destination, for that mint logic, I can price exactly how much gas I wanna provide as the gas limit for the transaction and the message value, and then have some extra composable action that I wanna have on top of that minting. Let's say I want to take that minted token that I just minted on Arbitrum and swap it for another ERC-20. I can provide the gas and index for that message there and be able to atomically execute that mint logic and execute that swap all without having to actually interact with that chain directly as an end user. And finally, I can even airdrop gas to a destination wallet on a destination chain, making it so that if users want to be onboarded to that new chain, they have gas to do so or fund more advanced contracts to execute on their own once that message has been delivered. You also have control over the order of messages. For minting, let's say, for an OFT, you might not care what message is delivered first, but let's say you have strict governance where you want to make sure every vote gets in before a certain timestamp, you can block messages that are not delivered. So what happens here is that if nonce one has been delivered but nonce two fails for some reason, let's say it runs out of gas or there's an issue with the actual input, nonce three and four will be blocked until nonce two is retried and cleared. You can also configure the message sizes themselves, making sure that you have consistent data types on every destination chain so that you don't have weird issues that might occur with overflows if you provide too many inputs or underflows. And finally, diving in a little bit deeper on that example I brought up, you have this idea of now horizontal composability. Instead of having to pack all of the functions that I wanna call for every application into one call, and if any of them fail, the whole thing reverts, I now have this concept of horizontal composability where each step in my transaction is atomic and separate each of itself. So if this swap transaction fails, I'm able to guarantee that I still received my token on the destination chain. And what all this builds up to is the idea of an omni-chain tech stack where any application, no matter the use case, can use layer zero, the protocol, to build their own smart contracts, either using provided standards that we have here or their own smart contract interface and communicate with this layer zero endpoint on every chain that we support, 50 plus currently, or any network that has broad ledger capabilities, not even a blockchain necessarily. And what this provides is a way for you to have not only this consistent congruent interface that will never change, but also configurability and ownership over your application in case things do need to be updated as better techniques and better systems are developed. Currently in the last few months, we've had some new protocols deploy on top of us. Clusters, uh, you may have heard of, is a cross-chain name service. It allows me to register my name across seven different chains, uh, with more chains being added at the moment. And with all of this, I have one name that applies to every wallet on every network, making it much easier for me to know where my assets are and to you know, share with you guys if you wanna uh, deposit or ask for transactions from this account. Uh, Decent.xyz is another great example. They allow for one-click cross-chain transactions and swaps. So as a user, going into that gas example I mentioned before, right, being able to have this composability and make sure that I can do each step in my execution logic one after another. Uh, Decent.xyz uses this for ensuring that I can, as a user, only pay once on the source chain and have multiple actions occur for me on the destination. And yeah, we just released a, a brand new CLI toolkit. I'll be going over how to build on top of this at ETH Global tomorrow for those of you who want uh, a live code example. But really, uh, we wanna see what people can start building with layer zero and we really would like to see uh, what the limits are of cross-chain messaging and really what the limits are for the protocol. So thank you so much.